This video is going to be a Protestant perspective on praying to the saints. If you're new to my channel, uh, I do a lot of ecumenical issues, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox differences. Truth Unites is also a place for really anything in the realm of theology and apologetics, trying to have an irenic approach, which means aiming for peace. And uh, subscribe and hit the bell button if you'd like to stay in touch, if you find value in this. So I'm not going to give a comprehensive treatment of praying to the saints. I'm going to try to basically just clarify what a Protestant concern is and then try to put some historical context on it. So this is just a modest video hoping to be a contribu uh, contribution in an ongoing dialogue for clarifying some of the issues, bringing in some historical context, partly for non-Protestant viewers who maybe could better understand where a Protestant is coming from, I hope this video will not give any undue offense, even though I'm going to be criticizing something you believe in. I'll try to do so respectfully and accurately to the best of my ability. But mainly for Protestant viewers, I am honestly embarrassed. So many Protestants don't know why they're Protestant. They're not familiar. They've not done their homework. They're not familiar with the historical issues, the historical arguments, the historical concerns. And so hopefully this video could be helpful for Protestants in understanding why don't we pray to the saints? What are what are the historic reasons why you know why we've uh, opposed ourselves to that practice? First, let's clarify what the concern isn't. The concern is not that we shouldn't honor the saints. Um, on the contrary, we should honor those who have gone ahead of us in the Lord into heaven. We should emulate their example. We should celebrate their legacy. You know, there actually is a lot to learn in the midst of our dialogue on this issue from our non-Protestant friends. When I've taught on Anselm and his practice of praying to the saints, I've often challenged students to try to do that. Even if you disagree with something, you might find, what can you learn? Because you can learn a lot. The whole idea of the communion of saints, which is in the Apostles' Creed, a lot of times Protestants haven't thought enough about that. And we need to be more careful to appreciate um, you know, for Anselm, I'll do another video on Anselm, his doctrine of friendship, for example, which is so powerful. And I think that may be one of the greatest blind spots of modernity is our loneliness and the fact that we've made romantic love the ultimate, and therefore we don't have a rich view of friendship. And uh, anyway, there's a lot as Protestants we need to learn and listen to as we're engaging on an issue like this. And so let's be clear, the concern is not, we need to be careful not to overreact, you know. Um, we should honor the saints. Um, the concern also is not that the saints in heaven are blind to or indifferent about the events of earth, uh, as though the church triumphant is has forgotten all about the church militant or something like that. Many Protestants, I mean, it, diff, one might differ from one Protestant to another. It's good to be cautious about this. Um, and not be dogmatic about it. But but many Protestants have been very open to say that, on the contrary, the saints are praying for us. For example, in the Lutheran tradition, the Augsburg Confession says, we also grant that the saints in heaven pray for the church in general. So the concern is not that direction. The, the concern is that we should not pray directly to the saints to ask for their intercession and other benefits from God to obtain from them. So let me articulate two, two uh, kind of historical context factors that contribute to that concern. The first is going to be about the on-the-ground, uh, real-life consequences of this practice, especially as it sort of mushrooms up into the medieval era and the sort of soteriological context in which it functioned. The second is going to be about the origins of this practice and when it comes into the picture. So starting with the second one first. Um, people often say, why is it wrong? If it's not wrong to ask your living Christian friend to pray for you, why would it be wrong? Why would it suddenly become idolatrous to do the same thing now just because they're with the Lord? Aren't they more alive than ever? That kind of thing. That's a very fair appeal. And uh, another appeal that Catholics and other non-Protestants often make that as Protestants we need to think about, again, historically how have Protestants thought about that, is it's not a zero-sum game. It's not as though if you really love your Christian brother, then you're going to love God less because you only have so much love to give. You know, it doesn't work like that. You can worship, you can love God by loving your Christian brother. And we are told rightly, I think, you know, you can worship God by honoring 
the, this saint or something like that. And then, of course, there's the distinction between worship and veneration that is made that I've addressed more in my video on icons. So I'll say less about that here directly. Now, here's my response to all of that. Um, all of that, I think much of that is valid, um, especially kind of on paper. But I also think it is absolutely imperative to appreciate how things actually played out. Like, what is the on-the-ground consequence of this practice? Is it really functioning like that, the zero-sum game? For example, when we pray to the saints, does this enhance our love for God and our understanding of the gospel or not? Now, I'm going to say a few things, and I want to preface them by saying I'm not arguing that all of the medieval practices uh, are such that in themselves they refute the notion of praying to the saints. All I'm trying to do with this first point is set historical context that will then position us to address that question, the, the biblical foundation of this practice. But what I've done is with the help of Martin Chemnitz and John Calvin and others, I've canvassed a number of hymns, breviaries, prayer books, and other liturgical texts from the late medieval era that did have the approval officially of the Roman Catholic Church and were in common usage among the laity. And I want us to, to feel a bit how uh, prayers to the saints were actually playing out. Because if we can get some common ground of like, oh yeah, I can see how that can go wrong, that will help us then go forward from there and it will maybe make a Protestant concern have a little bit more sense. So let me give some examples and what I want you to be listening for is the way forgiveness and the propitiation of God works. In other words, what's the soteriological context that's functioning here in these prayers? Quote, Lord, we ask that thou, placated by the intercession of all thy saints, mayest look graciously upon our infirmity and avert all the evils which we justly deserve. We pray thee, Lord, that the merits of blessed Mary, who is both perpetually a virgin and the bearer of God, may attend us and always implore thy forgiveness for us. Note this word forgiveness. It's going to come up in a lot of these. O noble Mary, excellent above all, procure for us forgiveness. O Mary, full of grace, sweet, mild, and beautiful, grant us grace. O glorious Mary, delicate in delights, prepare glory for us. O holy Virgin Mary, and all the saints and elect of God, come aid to me, wretched one, now and in the hour of my death, and make the Lord our God propitious to me by your merits and prayers. Do you, therefore, O Virgin Mary, approach the more than heavenly shrine of the ever-to-be-venerated Trinity? Offer for me now and in the hour of my death whatever of virtues and graces the King of Glory has been pleased to preserve in you as the safest treasury from the day of your conception to the hour of your assumption. I've been reading through a lot of these, combing through them, collecting all of the various titles that Mary is called, and then... Um, you know, trying to gather an impression of, again, how does medieval piety actually work? And I don't think I'm just picking the worst examples. I don't think I'm just highlighting the most abusive thing. I think it's very common in medieval piety for Mary to uh, play a very significant role here. I think one way I could articulate the concern is that many of these texts give the overall impression that God is a bit more distant, a bit more uncertain, and Mary is more tender and near and approachable. And the just flat out soteriology, I think, is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's been revealed in a book like Hebrews, for example, the epistle to the Hebrews, because we believe that it's through Christ's uh, mediatorial work, his priestly work specifically, that God has already been propitiated. There needs to be no more propitiation for sins. Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. And we can approach God directly by the Holy Spirit through the merits of Jesus Christ. And as much as we can, we, there could be a sort of formal agreement upon that in practice. Um, this is not a zero, this is not a both and here with Mary. It's not like, yeah, we can, it, because this is the appeal, you know, it's, it's Christ is our mediator, but that doesn't mean there can't be other intercessors and so forth. Yeah, but it can come into competition depending on how it plays out. And it's playing out here in ways that it is competitive. It is detracting from the sufficiency of Christ because the specific tasks 
that are the property of Christ in the gospel are being assigned to Mary here. Um, Here's more examples, quote, through you, that's Mary, forgiveness is granted to the guilty. Through you, grace is conferred to the just. O oh, you who are more beautiful than the stars and blessed above all women, placate your son and cleanse all faults of the faithful. See, this is an example of why it's not, you can't do the, well, it's a both and thing. The prayer, think about those words, placate your son. It, that's not a both end because in that prayer, the son is the one needing to be placated by Mary rather than um, the one who actually has fully placated God already. Uh, in some of these prayers, you get the sense that Mary's the only one who can help me. For example, from the prayer of Sixtus, O oh, Queen of Heaven, most gracious mother of your offspring, do not spurn me. I commend myself to you alone. In some passages, you get the sense that the, the author is saying, you know, where else could I turn but to Mary? Um, it's almost like in the Psalms where you have Psalm, Davidic Psalms where David will say, you know, I'm, out of, I'm at the end of my rope. Who, who else can deliver me but you, O Lord? And yet sentences like that are said to Mary. In fact, um, there's an entire re- uh, sort of renovating of the Psalms into this. You can look it up. Don't take my word for this, because I don't want you to think I'm exaggerating. Look up the Psalter of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is often attributed to Bonaventure. And it, all the Psalms are recast as directed to Mary. It's amazing. Here's one last example I'll give um, to, you know, accent this point of it's Mary alone. Like, we don't know where else to go but to Mary. Holy Mary, perpetual virgin of virgins, mother of mercy, mother of grace, hope of all the forsaken, comforter of all the despairing. It goes on for quite some time. The amount, the titles given to Mary are just, they couldn't be more exalted. Because I have been placed in diverse evils and anguish on account of my sins, I do not know to whom to flee save to you, my lady, sweetest Virgin Mary. Now, again, I know that these I, I'm sensitive to the fact that my reading these prayers can be provocative, and many people will want to be defensive um, and say, yeah, that's just the worst practice, or that's an abuse, or something like that. I actually don't think that the examples I've given are some crazy exception. I think, again, it's really easy to whitewash history. This was happening. This was a major problem in the medieval era. Um, I, I, again, want to clarify that I don't think that the, what I'm trying to draw attention to is simply historical context. I recognize the fact that many uh, Roman Catholic Christians would agree with my concern about these particular prayers. I would say, however, that I'm, I'm concerned that the Council of Trent did not sufficiently redress the errors. In the Council of Trent, there's the section on relics, images, and prayers to the saints. It does uh, curb some of the most uh, terrible practices in terms of, you know, drunkenness and reveling is ruled out at festivals. Um, filthy lucre is, is condemned with regard to relics. Um, anything that's lustful or immodest with regard to images, you know, there's lots of condemnations of, of terribly abusive practices at the Council of Trent, but it does affirm praying to the saints to obtain benefits from God. And I, I don't see anything in the Council of Trent that sufficiently redresses this error of thinking that um, Mary or another saint is going to give you something that really you should be looking to God alone to give you. So now let's address, now let's address this worry. This is the second part of the video. Okay, but was this just medieval excess? Was this just medieval abuse? Is this a good practice that went awry, or is it a bad practice that went worse? You know, that's one way of framing the question. And here I would basically want to articulate a historical interpretation of the first several centuries of the church, as well as a, a view of Holy Scripture, where I would say, I don't think that this was the case of a, a good and apostolic practice that Jesus would want us to practice that simply got taken too far. I think rather the interpretation I would offer, again, with love in my heart, and I hope this won't, uh, you know, give undue offense, is that it's a compromising with pagan practices that comes in in the third, fourth, and fifth centuries, but at first is very modest and very mild, and then it grows and grows and grows. So the historical interpretation I would have is that these 
the full-blown medieval errors are not the result of a good thing being perverted, but it's kind of like Solomon, you know, small steps of compromise lead to bigger and bigger compromises. It's something that's inherently wrong, but is getting more and more and more egregious. Now, again, because I know that that's going to be offensive for some, let me give some evidence for that, okay? So what I would say is basically this. Biblically, I am not aware of any compelling rationale for praying to the saints. Um, there's nothing clear and compelling. People try to derive it from various passages in Revelation, for example, Revelation 5.8, but none of these passages are actually talking about praying to the saints. They don't actually address the consequence that needs to be established. And then there's other passages that really you can't look to as a sound basis for a practice, like a parable with the Lazarus or when the guards at the crucifixion of Jesus say he's calling on Elijah. We've even seen people try to argue for praying to the saints from passages like that as though it's not problematic to derive our theology from these uh, pagan Roman soldiers. There's nothing that I see in scripture that is clear or compelling that this is actually a practice God would want us to do. Moreover, I don't see any examples of prayers to the saints for the first roughly 200 years of church history. So here's a good entry point into this. I think you start seeing it in the mid-third century. So here's a good entry point. Origen, in his commentary on the Epistle to the Romans, written in the 240s, uh, is among the earlier Christians to speculate about how does the church triumphant relate to the church militant? And listen to how cautious he is and how he puts it. He says, quote, If indeed the saints who are outside the body and with Christ do and work anything in our behalf after the manner of the angels who perform services for our salvation, let this also be considered among the secret things of God, not to be committed to paper. In other words, it, when you start seeing speculation about this, it's more in the realm of speculative thought. It's not referenced as kind of a common belief or a universal practice. Moreover, when Origen faces the charge from Celsus, the pagan philosopher, that we shouldn't only pray to God. Celsus says we should pray to other spirits who are present in heaven with God. Now, Celsus's whole theology of that is very different, so we won't get into all that. Um, Origen rejects that proposal, and he says, we offer humble prayers to God himself, who is over all, through his only begotten Son, to whom we make supplication inasmuch as he is the propitiation of our sins, in order that he, as our high priest, may offer our prayers to God. Now someone can say, well, or that's not ironclad because Origen is opposing Celsus's particular proposal. That doesn't necessarily mean prayers to the saints he would oppose as well. I mean, again, when we're working with historical uh, data like this, it is good to be cautious and not to oversell our conclusions. But I would just say, combine that with what you see, I would say universally to my awareness, earlier than Origen, we just don't have any, like in the New Testament, there's no prayers to Stephen after Stephen is martyred, when, uh, or, or, or to James. Uh, when Clement is writing to the Corinthians and he references Paul, he never references any prayers or supplica supplications or invocations given to Paul. Um, when Polycarp, this is a good example, Polycarp, um, there's the epistle of, from the Smyrnians, sometimes it's called the martyrdom of Polycarp. It talks, it is a very high view, again, where Protestants can learn. It's a very high view of how we should honor Polycarp, but it makes the distinction. Quote, we worship Christ as the Son of God. The martyrs, however, we love as disciples and imitators of the Lord, as is right, on account of their un unsurpassable benevolence toward their king and teacher, and we wish to become their companions and disciples. There's no prayers to Polycarp. I don't see this practice early on. And so the concern, and then even after it comes in in the fourth and fifth century, there's a lot of ambivalence. You see Augustine, you know, Augustine is very kind of con interesting on this. He, he'll have statements that seem to almost conflict with each other. He, um, for example, read what he says about praying at the tombs of martyrs and some of his concerns about the superstitions developing there. It feels very different when you're looking at the Cappadocian Fathers or Augustine or fourth and fifth century practices to the later medieval practices. And so, in other words, the Protestant, to try to clarify and explain, what is the Protestant view? Our concern is that this is a historical accretion or a historical innovation, something that gradually comes into the picture, 
and it's not a actually authentically related to the first century, to the teaching of the apostles, to the biblical instruction, to something Jesus ever taught us to do. And, uh, it, you know, in other words, another way you could put it is, what changed in the third century? Why did we suddenly start seeing this there? And because of that, we'd say these later medieval practices that are, from our vantage point, constitu constitutive of idolatry. Uh, these are not simply abuses of something good, but this is actually an alien practice that has come into the church. It's not something that's authentically from the first century. Let me conclude in this way. The, con the animating concern behind all of this is not just to be negative and critical of something else, but it's out of concern to protect something good because it is helpful to finish on this note and remember this. Um, the epistle of Hebrews teaches that we can go directly to the throne of grace. Christ is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because of his priestly work on our behalf and his incarnate work and now his high priestly work, uh, intercessory work for us. And that because of that, we can obtain the grace and mercy we need for our actual struggles right now. It's like we've got a six lane highway. We can go directly to God himself. So if you've got that, we don't want anything to obscure that. We don't want anything to get in the way of that. We don't want anything to, uh, you know, d direct our attention elsewhere. And that's the ultimate concern from a Protestant standpoint with praying to the saints is it's uh, in its actual uh, consequence in real life, it does draw us away from the sufficiency of Christ as our mediator. Um, so let me know what you think. I hope I've not been unfair. I hope I've not given undue offense. I am sensitive to the fact that this is a very delicate topic. So please feel free to let me know if you think I crossed a boundary anywhere and certainly feel free to give counter arguments. Uh, this will be my last video on ecumenical stuff for a couple of weeks, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox issues. I am going to do an interview with William Lane Craig on his book on historical Adam and Eve in about a week. I'm excited for that. I'm also going to do a video on the beatific vision what is that? I'm going to give a defense of that, do that next week. Also, I just got my new book in the mail. This is just the first copy I got, Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. I'm going to do a launch video for this book when it officially launches later this month. So be on the lookout for that as well. Hey, thanks for watching. Really appreciate the support. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you enjoyed this. God bless you.